So a very good afternoon. My name is Bhavna Chawla. I come from All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi. And uh, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you who have come here today. And uh, because this is actually a very special session. Special in some ways. Number one, it's the inaugural session of a society that we have just launched, the Eye Cancer Society of India. And uh, this, for this, we have very special uh, guests who are here with us today. Dr. Jyotir Mehr Biswas, who needs no introduction. Yeah. And uh, very, very dear to me as a, my most respected teacher. We also have some young colleagues who are going to join me on this journey and this effort to promote the care of ocular malignancies in India. One is Dr. Rajesh Pate Bahadur. He has trained with me as a PG student. I thought that he will never like to see my face ever in life because of you know how much I used to scold him during his thesis days. But he is smiling here. So I think that he has not taken it to heart. <laughs> okay. And then we have uh, Dr. Rajesh Pate Bahadur is currently assistant professor at Ames Nagpur. And we have Dr. Bijna, she is uh, assistant professor at Ames Bhubaneswar. They are all also very much interested in working in ocular oncology, eye cancers. So I am just waiting now for Dr. Natrajan because he is going to take over as the president of this society. He is uh, himself, you know, a very well-known uh, figure in ophthalmology uh, circles. He is uh, holding the presidential position in many other societies. He has great experience, so he is going to guide us and lead us on this path. And we also have Dr. Sunil Singh, who is, yeah, who is going to, yeah, who is the person who has organized all the local arrangements here. So I welcome you all. And the reason I wanted to start this society is that so far, like my experience, I work in uh, ocular oncology at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, and there we get a lot of patients of eye cancers. So when we talk of eye cancers, mainly what we see is retinoblastoma in children. We also see cases of uveal melanoma in adults. And then we also see periocular lid cancers, which are more common in our part of the world. So if you see in the West, like, you know, um, ocular oncology is a subspeciality that has already taken off as an independent subspeciality. But I feel that in India, much needs to be done. Mostly it is just practiced as a side, uh, you know, sort of a branch, either with oculoplasty or sometimes, you know, among retina specialists. Yeah, so I have always been think, thinking and when we see these patients coming to us from all over India, we feel that there are very few centers in the country that actually treat these patients and many of them have to travel long distances so they come to us at a very late stage and we are not, despite having all the treatment facilities and everything, we are not able to give the kind of survival rates that are prevalent in the West. So from, you know, the point of view of increasing awareness, we kind of need a pan-India initiative, more sensitivity towards treatment of eye cancers, more, you know, centers, more specialists who would be interested in taking it up as a full-time discipline. And, you know, not just ophthalmologists, you know, we also want allied professionals and other, our other multi, because it needs a multidisciplinary approach. So we also reach out to pediatricians, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, community uh, ophthalmologists, everybody, you know, to join in this, you know, effort as a united front. So with that, uh, you know, uh, goal in mind, we thought that we should have a society because only when we form a society, we can work towards a common goal and a common objective. So that is the whole purpose and I welcome you all here and I'm also very happy uh, to see ma'am here, Dr. Jolly. She's been my teacher and uh, deeply respected uh, person in ophthalmology. So we need blessings. Thank you, ma'am for joining us in this endeavor. And we also have Dr. Tejas, who's kindly, uh, you know, spared time to come here. And uh, so, you know, I, this is a pan-India initiative. So AIOS is, you know, one of the, the perfect uh, sort of forum or platform to launch something like this because people from all over India, unless they join us in this fight, we will not be successful. 
So with these few words, I welcome you to this session. And we are just waiting. Uh, we will be, you know, having a small lamp lighting uh, uh, ceremony. So we are just waiting for Dr. Natarajan uh, to join us for that. But in the meantime, I will start with the presentations. So we can all... Uh, We have an oration here to start this uh, with Dr. Arun Singh. So Dr. Arun Singh is currently practicing in Cleveland, US, and he has you know, uh, done a lot of work in ocular oncology. He, is, uh, he has roots in India, uh, but he is also very, uh, he's very distinguished. He's been the editor of British Journal of Ophthalmology, and he's also been the president of the International Society of Ocular Oncology. So we have Dr. Arun Singh's oration and we also have another lecture from Dr. Sachin Salvi, who is the clinical lead for ocular oncology in UK. So let's see, uh, you know, there this, we are talking about global perspectives. So we get to hear about how ocular oncology is practiced all over the world. So I will begin with the first presentation by Dr. Arun Singh. Unfortunately, he could not join us uh, physically. So he has sent us his recorded presentation. So let's uh, hear from Dr. Arun Singh what he is, has to say about this. Mm. cases occur in low to middle income countries. And therefore the choices we have in the United States or New Zealand are could be very different than choices in Patna, Delhi, or Hyderabad or other cities in India. And that's because why? Well we know there is difficulty in accessing care, lack of infrastructure, uh, misdiagnosis, long travel, income, poverty, many issues, cultural issues. So there are many challenges. And how do we overcome that? Well, through education and awareness of trying to deliver care beyond the big cities using uh, health standards, making it affordable and accessible. I think the formation of the Society of Eye Cancer Society of India will be a first and important step towards national collaboration and standardization of treatment particularly collection of data, look at the low efficacy at each centers, and then trying to lobby or um, seek support from governmental agencies and also some NGOs. So unless you get together as a society, um, the national level interventions are not really possible. And that's the real challenge. 
So what are the choices we have uh, in the management of retinoblastoma? Essentially, it boils down to enucleation versus intravenous chemotherapy versus intraarterial chemotherapy. So why we are where we are today uh, gives a, it's good to reflect upon the evolution of treatment to realize our present situation and how that may be affecting our decision making. And I'll end my presentation with using uh, three recent cases under our care. So if you look at very briefly, evolution of treatment of retinoblastoma, it starts with enucleation way back in 1850 when chloroform came around. And that was lasted till 1900 for about 50 years. And for the next 100 years, from 1900 to roughly 2000, the conservative therapy that was available was predominantly excellent radiation. And it took many years to find out that this wasn't the best thing because the patients were getting hydrogenic cancers, the second malignant neoplasms. And then there's a wave of chemotherapy from year 2000. For the last 20 years or so, we've moved towards chemotherapy. So currently, I would say the conservative therapy of retinoblastoma is chemotherapy predominant. We first started with intravenous chemotherapy, and then for the last 10, 15 years, we have had intraarterial chemotherapy that came along with intravitreal chemotherapy. And the idea being, uh, you are, with the target organ being the eye, you're trying to reduce the systemic toxicity and increase, um, uh, and in the end, you end up increasing uh, ocular toxicity. So the aim is to reduce systemic toxicity, but if you deliver chemotherapy to the target organ, you are increasing local toxicity. We are all familiar with uh, this intraarterial catheters and how it's positioned at the, at the origin of the ophthalmic artery. All we are trying to do is deliver drug through the ophthalmic artery, perfuse the choroid, retina, and the vitreous. Right. And to achieve that, you need this huge setup yes. of a fluoroscopic room right. and all this setup. The child is there and the arrow is pointing to little eye somewhere there. And to deliver this, you need the expertise, not just the equipment. You need a highly trained individuals, interventional radiologists. And that's Dr. Masaryk, who started this program almost 10 years ago at Cleveland Clinic, and coordinator. This is our nurse coordinator, Jackie, who is busy trying to put everybody together to deliver uh, this kind of intervention, which is, can be challenging even in a big center like ours. We also know that the ISE has less systemic toxicity is safe because you do not get neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, uh, no risk of hearing loss that might happen with carboplatin, and maybe some questionable risk of uh, leukemia that may be attributed to etoposide. But there is a significant risk of bronchospasm that the anesthesia people are dealing with during the procedure. And the trade-off being increased local toxicity, more local toxicity. Eyelid edema, et cetera, are not major problems, the biggest being the ophthalmic or the retinal vascular occlusions. That can be in up to 30% of cases in different series. But we know, fortunately, that this incidence reduces as the experience in a given center increases. And some of it may also depend upon the, the size of the ophthalmic artery ostium. And so here it is, um, an angiogram showing ophthalmic artery stenosis. And what does it cause? But well, total loss of vision. So the whole purpose of using ISC, in fact, is to preserve the globe, maintain some vision, and here you have preserved the globe, but there's no vision. So it's self-defeating to some extent, and this is the limitation, one of the limitations of ISC. The other uh, limitation that I would want to point out is the quality of the data that we have. It's based on retrospective studies, selected cases, a lot of confounding variables that include prior therapy, concomitant therapy, subsequent therapy, particularly the usage of intravitreal chemotherapy that came along, that came about at the same time that the IAC became widely used. So if you look at the numbers of efficacy, for efficacy of IAC, we say, well, it's approximately 75% uh, in four to five years. And if you were to review the data and then look at the efficacy for intravenous chemotherapy, we say the number is approximately 40%. For group DI, that's what we're looking at for now. And we say, well, 
it's, it's, it's not inferior to intra-arterial, although there is no head-to-head -head trial to compare this. And some of it may be due to the fact that the intra-arterial chemotherapy has been used in conjunction with intra-virtual chemotherapy, whereas no such comparison uh, has been done, or no such interventions or data has been collected with the use of intravenous and intravirtual chemotherapy. So the data is skewed by the evolving practice patterns, and that's why I wanted to, to mention how the treatment has evolved, has somehow has skewed our perception of efficacies of treatment. And if you were to review all the data, and I'm grateful to Raval Vishal, Vishal Raval, who did the detailed review, and if you were to estimate the recurrences of IVC that could have been prevented with intravirtual chemotherapy, we anticipate the number of overall efficacy to increase to about 70%. And this is being currently investigated by a study undertaken by Children Oncology Group um, at, uh, in the United States. So if you were to compare intravenous with intra-arterial, well, intravenous is widely available. It does not need that kind of expertise and may have some advantages in reducing the risk of metastasis, may also reduce the risk of a trilateral retinoblastoma. And whereas the biggest issue facing ISE is the cost, which may be a huge burden, uh, particularly in the developing nations, where the retinoblastoma is most common. I want to highlight uh, three recent cases indicating our preferences in choosing different methods of treatment. If a child has a group DEI and no vision potential, particularly with neovascular changes, some suspicion for of extraocular extension on imaging, we would say that it's better to enucleate the eye. But if there is some vision potential, child has is bilateral disease, less than three months of age, we say, well, maybe we should use intravenous chemotherapy. We're trying to avoid tandem intraarterial chemotherapy. They're trying to, uh, in a three-month-old baby, it may be difficult to catheterize the, the ophthalmic artery. So here's the superior nasal tumor in the right eye, diffuse seating, but the disc and macula are not involved. So this could, is a good case for ocular salvage. And the other eye has group C, a group of BTCs. So this child in our center was treated with intravenous chemotherapy. And here's a child who has good vision potential, similarly, similar to the first case, but the difference being that there is expected to be good vision in this eye, and the neovascular complications and the extraocular extension are not present. So here's the child uh, who was noted to have leukocoria on a routine examination at uh, one and a half years of age or something. And you can see a uh, blunting of the foveal or the red reflex in the right eye. And this was due to diffuse vitreous seeding, disc and macula were directly not involved because the tumor was nasal. So we thought that this was unilateral. So it was a good candidate we thought for intraarterial chemotherapy. And this is what was done. And one can say after three cycles of intraarterial chemotherapy, the tumor is regressed very nicely, nasal portrait. The disc is normal, and the, and the seeds are also trying to, to get calcified, and one can see here that the seeds are completely disappeared, with some becoming calcified, and showing normal disc and macular vision being 2040. So this is an ideal case, it's an ideal situation but not all are the same. So in conclusion, we would say that the treatment that you recommend depends upon what expertise you have available, and keeping in mind the long-term burden of time, travel, costs, uh, that the families have to undergo to access good care. So in general, conservative therapy of retinoblastoma with IVC or ISE would require anything up to 30 to 35 EUAs, pretty much every month, for the first three years of child's life. That's a huge burden, no matter how well off you might be. So the choices in the end depends upon the choices we have. The choices in the United States may be different than choices that we have or we can make in India, for example. So with that, I conclude and I said, well, if you look at the global aspects of management of retinoblastoma, we say, well, there is innovation 
Now, in the public health approach, we said this is a public health issue, and we look at the high-tech innovations such as intra-arterial, intra-virtual chemotherapy. But in balance, if you were to improve the survival of retinoblastoma across the globe, you really think, I really think, public health approach should take an upper hand, although high-tech innovation, which is affordable, that goes hand in hand. Thank you so much for allowing to share my thoughts. I feel so privileged and I congratulate you all uh, on establishing uh, this uh, important uh, society, the Eye Cancer Society of India. Thank you. So now we, since this is a launch of a new society, um, we would be having a you know, l small ritual of lamp lighting and officially inaugurating this society. So I request everyone who is present here to please come. So we have Dr. Arban Slal, President Dr. elect, Dr. Uh, what's her name? Bhavna Chawla, Dr. Virginia Panda, Dr. Alok, Dr. Bishwas. And
Microphone. Microphone. I think it is the need of the hour that uh, we are having this Eye Cancer Society of India because the uh, anybody not having good vision, it is a lot of cost to the society. So, if a child is in someone's house who is not seeing good, then the cost to the society or parents is वो मिलियंस ऑफ डॉलर्स में चली जाती है क्योंकि उसको हर समय देखभाल करने वाला आदमी चाहिए उसको सेल्फ सफिशिएंट बनाना एक बहुत मुश्किल काम है तो अगर ये सोसाइटी जो इसमें एडवांसेस हो रहे हैं और वो अगर ज़्यादातर लोगों में परकुलेट हो और ज़्यादातर लोगों को पता लगे और लोगों का टाइम से इलाज हो सके तो ये सब बच्चे जो हैं वो पर्टिकुलरली रेटनो के वो लाइफ में काफ़ी एक्टिव कंट्रीब्यूट कर सकते हैं सेल्फ सफिशिएंट रह सकते हैं और बाकी भी जितने भी तरह की मैलिग्नेंसीज हैं आज की तारीख में कोई भी डिसफिगरमेंट नहीं चाहेगा कि उसका चेहरा देखने में अच्छा ना लगे या उसके स्कार हो या वहाँ पे गड्ढा हो तो उनका अगर मिनिमली डैमेज के साथ कम से कम डैमेज के साथ उसके स्ट्रक्चर्स को री किया जा सके ताकि वो अपनी एक अच्छी कॉन्फिडेंट और कामयाब जिंदगी बिता सके तो इससे अच्छा हम कुछ नहीं कर सकते हैं और जब भी हम लोग बात करते हैं किसी से तो हम लोग आँखों में आंखें डाल के बात करते हैं तो शरीर के किसी भी और अंग में कोई अगर कमी है तो इतनी आसानी से पता नहीं चलती है नोटिसेबल नहीं होती है लेकिन अगर किसी की आँख में कोई भी कमी है तो इमीडिएटली नोटिस हो जाती है तो ये बहुत ज़रूरी है कि हमारी आइज़ फंक्शनल रहें और देखने में खूबसूरत लगे और इसमें जो डिसफिगरमेंट का या लॉस ऑफ विजन का जो चांसेज हैं पर्टिकुलरली इन्हें यंग पॉपुलेशन एंड एक्चुअली इन ओल्ड पॉपुलेशन ऑल्सो वो मैलिग्नेसी की वजह से है तो आई एम श्योर कि दिस सोसाइटी विल डू ए ग्रेट जॉब एंड टू हेल्प द पेशेंट एंड गिव द नॉलेज टू अदर आई सर्जनस अक्रॉस द कंट्री एंड मोटिवेट देम टू एक्सेप्ट द चैलेंजेस एंड इफ दे कॉन्ट एक्सेप्ट द चैलेंजेस एट लीस्ट रेफर देम टू द राइट डॉक्टर सो विद दिस माई बेस्ट विशेज टू द यंग सोसाइटी And I'm sure it is going to go places. Thank Young you, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dr. Harbans Lal. And uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Bhavna Chawla. In the meantime, anybody else wants to give some words? Yes. Dr. Bishwas, Dr. Alok. You have a microphone if, if they want to say. JB, you want to say something? And one thing comes to my mind, Dr. She Ratan Tata. No, give it. No, no, sir. Uh, Ratan Tata is my friend, and I think he has uh, told me he's making 100 uh, cancer hospitals. I think that gives me an impetus to talk to him to make sure one uh, separate institution should be there. Maybe you can microphone then. Sir, who microphone then? You kept it here. As uh, Dr. Harbans Lal uh, talked, there's a need of the hour, and we need a much more specialized knowledge and specialized. Uh, 
um, skill to deal with the ocular cancers. It's now has become a, a specialty itself and need uh, trained people as well as the paramedical person as well as uh, other specialties to make them aware of the ocular cancer is a separate entity and its proper management is uh, need of the hour. I think Dr. Bhavna has taken a good step. Thank you, JB. Now, Dr. Bhavna, you can give your talk. Hello, um, you want to say something? Dr. Bhavna, it was a very, very good idea to have this society. And uh, especially now that, you know, for us, each and every person is important. Previously, if somebody was having uh, cancer, people used to just leave him alone. But now they want that everybody should get the proper treatment. And they also have, they should also be able to live their life with dignity. So it's a very good idea. and I hope that this society really progresses very well. And I've seen your work also. You have done a lot of work on uh, retinoblastoma especially, and it is a very good idea, especially for the people to know when to refer, where to refer, because everybody cannot do this uh, type of uh, treatment. So all the best to you. So I'll just run through a quick presentation of mine, which is on uh, the Indian scenario. Okay, why we need a, like a society of this kind that is going to be covered by uh, Natarajan sir. But I will just talk a little bit about uh, the Indian scenario, what our own experiences, and where do we need to go from here, right? So here it is, retinoblastoma. We all know that the goals of therapy as far as RB is concerned is saving life saving eyes and now with the latest technological advances that we have, saving vision. So this was a paper which motivated me to actually uh, come up with this society and this was a clinical presentation and survival of retinoblastoma in Indian children which I studied at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And what I saw was while doing this study and we had a cohort of 600 children of RB who were referred to us from all over the country. We found that at presentation more than one fourth of these children already had extraocular spread. So this got me really worried and concerned. You know, the West is boasting of 98, 99% survival. They get children at the early stage. Why is it that we are getting cases of orbital retinoblastoma? Something really needs to be done at the community level. And then uh, after this, uh, we started working towards, uh, you know, reducing this. And this, this uh, problem is not just in India, it extends to Asia. You know, because in all uh, in Asian countries more or less uh, share this similar kind of profile. 43% of the global uh, burden of retinoblastoma is in Asia. So if we are able to change the outcomes in Asia, India being a very prominent country, then we are actually going to change the outcome for the whole continent. And then we all know that orbital retinoblastoma, once it becomes extraocular, it is a major contributor to mortality. So that is where the concern is. So how do we manage these cases? You know, children come to us with proptosis, pain, redness. They may even have a fungating mass. They may have lymph node enlargement when they come to us at presentation. So we do a contrast MRI of the orbit and brain. We confirm the diagnosis, look at the local extent of the disease, send the child to the pediatric oncologist for a you know, metastatic workup because this needs a multidisciplinary approach. So when it comes to management now, we have luckily we have developed management protocols that are leading to good survival even in patients with orbital retinoblastoma. And this is the multimodal approach that we use. So what essentially it means is that, you know, we treat the child initially with systemic intravenous chemotherapy. And then once the tumor burden is reduced, uh, the child undergoes an enucleation surgery followed by radiation and adjuvant chemotherapy. So this was a landmark paper that 
were we published in the uh, ophthalmology journal where we compared the efficacy and safety of chemotherapy protocols for treating stage 3b rb and this is one of those cases in the series where you can find this is how the child came to us with this orbital mass this was the mri presentation below and then you find a dramatic reduction with chemotherapy and then you know the child underwent enucleation radiation therapy and now is leading a near normal life Again, children who come with lymph nodes, stage 3B, I mean, what would you do to such a child? If such a child comes to you with RB, the first question that would come to your mind is, my God, what were you doing for so long? But the problem is that the parents are actually struggling. They're taking the child to multiple centers, you know, taking advice, in, you know, just, you know, being sent here and there. They're not able to come to the right place at the right time, and that is why these kind of situations arise. So we sh this is what we want to avoid. But in any case, even if the child comes with this situation, it's not that you have to just ask, they say, tell them that everything is over for you. We have to still try, and believe me, it works. So again, this multimodal treatment, it is the same child showing significant reduction in the orbital and submandibular mass with the, all the treatment uh, modalities combined, and this child has also now completed two years of follow-up with us. Again, we have, again, in AIMS, we have started autologous stem cell transplantation. If the child is having orbital retinoblastoma that is extended to metastatic disease, the bone marrow, or different parts of the body, those children also now are showing survival with autologous stem cell transplant. So it is not that, you know, we have to just dismiss the child and say that nothing can be done and just tell the parents to return home. Long-term outcomes of orbital retinoblastoma, again, they are showing, uh, you know, encouraging results. And we, although, of course, nothing like early diagnosis. If we are able to catch them early, we don't have to go through all this. But the point is that even if we get them later, we still manage to save more than 50% of these children. But unfortunately, the rest of them, they do succumb to... Uh, this thing and challenges especially as far as CNS metastasis is concerned we still don't have you know a successful treatment for CNS metastasis so we have to prevention is the only way and the only way by doing it is doing catching them early now having said that you know if, uh, um, as far as the Indian scenario is concerned two other things that I want to tell you is that we have also had seen a paradigm shift towards globe salvage treatments there was a time when intraocular retinoblastoma was like okay I'm now only enucleation nothing else but but then, of course, enucleation itself is a very traumatic thing, you know, for the parents, for the child, for the family. So therefore, now we have, luckily, globe salvage treatments where we can even save the eye. And when, what are these and when do they work? So mostly what we are using is transpupillary thermotherapy, cryotherapy, and intravenous chemotherapy. If the tumor is posterior to the equator or anterior to the equator, they can be treated with these laser transpupillary thermotherapy, cryotherapy, combined with intravenous chemotherapy. This has been going on for almost 20 20 years for early stage RB and if the we are able to uh, save reasonable number of eyes depending upon the stage at which they present and many times we are able to even preserve their vision. So this is uh, generally how the, these things are done but uh, this is one you know this is a red cam picture you see one of the uh, children who were treated like this this tumor above and below this is showing a nice response the tumor is completely regressed after intravenous chemotherapy and transpupillary thermotherapy. This is again a nice picture showing post cryotherapy results. So these work for early tumors, they do work. But there are times when this also fails. Then what do you do? You want to still save the eye. Sometimes it is the only eye. The other eye has already been enucleated and you still want to save it. And intravenous chemotherapy is not working. That is where super selective intraarterial chemotherapy has come in. Now this becomes a very technically challenging procedure because it involves direct cannulation of the ophthalmic artery and de targeted delivery of the chemotherapeutic drug to the eye. So this was a landmark paper published 10 years ago and after that we adopted this technique at AIMS and now it's been 10 years since we've been providing this service of intraarterial chemotherapy to retinoblastoma children as well. And this is called super selective intraarterial chemotherapy. Why super selective? Because you're directly going into the ophthalmic artery and injecting the drug to the tumor. And it does make sense because retinoblastoma is inside the eye. Why do you want to give systemic chemotherapy, intravenous chemotherapy? That is going to cause toxicity to the whole body you want some kind of a treatment that is directed only to the eye and save the body from the side effects of systemic chemotherapy but the flip side is that it is technically very challenging it needs a multidisciplinary team 
you have to do a careful case selection. Not all cases of retinoblastoma will benefit from intraarterial chemotherapy. So how do you know which ones will? So when, when it's, there is advanced intraocular retinoblastoma, there's chemo reduction failure, you've already tried intravenous chemotherapy, you don't want to under, uh, the child to undergo enucleation. Sometimes it can also be used as a primary treatment because now like for 10 years, we have the expertise, our interventional neuroradiologist is confident to do the procedure. We can even try it as a primary treatment. And of course, we cannot do it if there is already anterior chamber invasion, secondary glaucoma, and you know, complicated retinoblastoma, advanced retinoblastoma, extraocular disease, then we cannot do this. So the challenge is developing a multidisciplinary team. And this is a short video where I can show you how the intraarterial, I don't know if I have time or <coughs> can I? Can I? Yes. Okay, so this is the interventional neuroradiology lab where we actually do the intraarterial chemotherapy procedure to save eyes from retinoblastoma. So the general anesthesia, these are the things that are used. We have a guiding catheter, a guide wire, and a microcatheter, which is to be used. Here you can see, you know, this procedure is done under fluoroscopic guidance, and you can see a femoral artery is punctured. If you remember the anatomy of the ophthalmic artery, how do you reach the ophthalmic artery? You puncture the femoral artery, go into the abdominal aorta, go into into the ascending aorta and then into the internal carotid artery and then into the ophthalmic artery. So you can imagine how technically difficult and complex this procedure is. But luckily, you know, we have very skilled interventional neuroradiologists at AIMS and they are doing this procedure for us. So this is, you can see the catheter going all the way up. Now here it is, the challenge is to enter the ophthalmic artery. So the tip of the microcatheter will now enter the ophthalmic artery. And that is when a dye is injected. This is the arteriogram. You can see over here, we have to first confirm the blood supply. Because you want to enter the ophthalmic artery, you want to make sure that the ophthalmic artery is a branch of the internal carotid artery. If there is any aberrant vascular supply, you may end up uh, injecting the drug into some other artery. So we have to confirm the vasculature by doing an arteriogram. Here in this particular child, you can see this is the the small little thing you can offshoot, you can see is the of ophthalmic artery. And now you can see how the microcatheter is entering the ophthalmic artery. It will be placed there and then you can make sure that whatever drug you are injecting is going into the tumor. So this is how the procedure is done. Here you can see just the ophthalmic artery is now being this. Now this is the melphalan drug that is freshly prepared when we do this procedure and we inject it over a period of 30 minutes. So this is how, and uh, these are some pictures to show uh, patients who benefited. You know, they were one-eyed patients. One eye was already enucleated because of retinoblastoma. The other eye, we tried intravenous chemotherapy. It failed. Then we did intraarterial chemotherapy, and these children, we were able to preserve their globes. Sometimes we are also not able to, we are able to preserve globes, and also sometimes we are able to preserve vision because of this. So these are important advances in retinoblastoma that have taken place. And of course, there can be complications. The other thing that I will quickly cover is plaque brachytherapy, which we are using now for retinoblastoma patients. And now we have a Made in India plaque. Three months ago, I did the first Made in India uh, uh, plaque brachytherapy uh, for retinoblastoma patients in the country. And the child is now doing very well. So how do we do plaque brachytherapy? Basically, these are ruthenium plaques. And uh, depending upon where the tumor is located, we actually have to place these plaques. And as you know, this is a radioactive material. So this patient, while the plaque is in C2, has to be isolated. He has to stay separately. And then, you know, how long the plaque will be placed is calculated carefully by the dosimetry, depending upon the dimensions of the tumor. So again, this procedure we have to do with the help of our radiation oncologists and with the help of our uh, medical physicists. They help us with this procedure. So here you can see the muscle, inferior rectus muscle is being dissected and hooked. And uh, this is being done. This is the BRC plaque that we are actually inserting. So first we put a dummy plaque. We make sure that it is in a secure position. The tumor location is marked. And then once we have the uh, marking of the correct uh, place, then we confirm it with the intraoperative ultrasound that the plaque is in the correct position. You can see how it is being placed, that it is right over the tumor and nowhere else. And then after we have done that, then we will remove the dummy plaque, and then we will place it with the actual radioactive plaque. 
So this is how basically the plaque brachytherapy is done. Again, this is done in very carefully selected cases. Not all patients benefit, but it has really become a blessing for children, especially who are one-eyed, who have failed systemic chemotherapy, who had nothing else, no other option except enucleation. In those cases, we are able to save these lives. So this is an example how nicely the plaque worked in this patient. This book that we have just brought up with my colleague, she's a faculty at Harvard Medical School, Global Perspectives in Ocular oncology so ocular oncology is really developing as it has you know found a place as a super specialized discipline all over the world and in India also we need to you know sort of develop this discipline as an independent super speciality and in engage more and more people because there are lots and lots of patients of eye cancer who can benefit from this and uh, I acknowledge the contribution, uh, uh, whatever work that I have done, I would like to acknowledge you know, my mentors, my <coughs> teachers, the teams that I have always worked with who have helped us achieve whatever little we have done so far. And thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Bhavna. I think a very important part, I think you are uh, really uh, thank you for uh, starting this uh, society. And uh, anybody has any comments or questions? How do the rest of patients feel over the x-ray? Let's say, like I said, I get some kind of contact me to the x-ray. How do the rest of patients feel over the x-ray? So you can just kind of have my contact number because that will, you know, sort of help them to overcome the administrative challenges and all of, you know, coming to a large hospital and hunting for, so I think that would be the fastest and quickest. So at Ames Delhi, you can so just... Or you have any social workers then? Yeah, we have social workers. But uh, the thing is that uh, I think that it will be more efficient if, you know, you directly you communicate with a doctor. Yeah. No, ocular oncology. Parodi melanoma, yes. We have, yeah, we have another presentation on adult eye cancers. So, yeah, everything. Next is what's fine. But a present day. So Dr. Natrajan is now going to give the next talk on the need for such a society. I think that is something that is really the essence of this symposium, that why there is a need for such a society. And so is the currently the president of Teleophthalmology Society of India. He is also the president of the uh, Ocular Genetics Society. And sir so has been the ex-president of the AIOS. So a lot of experience in leadership positions. And no, all India, all India, all India, yeah, not Delhi. Delhi, 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 Delhi Ophthalmology Society. So his leadership skills and his humane qualities will be very important for the development of this society. We are, we are just just taking baby steps. We look so forward to his I Actually, I was a little teacher. hesitant to lead this, but then when she said, because actually I'm working on with Dr. Arun Singh and Dr. Gangadhar Sundar from uh, Singapore, where we went to, uh, there's a separate Somaya Medical College in um, uh, Bombay, it's a private, where they had an Asian cancer hospital, where they hired a place in the, like the US, uh, a place in the medical college and did. So I thought, why not we have a separate also, because most of the patients who come from retinal blastoma are poor, somehow in the lower uh, 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 social economic strata. So I thought private hospitals seeing they will be afraid, plus they can't afford. And uh, we have Akshay Nair as a oculoplastic, as an ocular oncologist and trained in Heli Prasad. He also said we need multi-speciality like Dr. Bishwa has mentioned and uh, he, she has the radiology, the other, so many things required. So we thought we'll have adjacent to the main cancer hospital. and. And Bombay has the Tata Cancer Hospital. And so happened, Ratan Tata is my good friend. But he is starting 100, I don't know how many years completed. 
I think Varanasi, and uh, so I, I know in many places where the cancer was not there, he started. So I accepted uh, to Dr. Bhavna that I'll, the, that's why the talk about a need for such a society, the Eye Cancer Society of India. Eye cancer is a cancer that forms in the, there are many people, patients don't know that eye cancer can happen in the eye. I don't know why. Some of they think that <laughs> eye cancer, they'll ask. And eye cancer can occur in the newborn, in children, and in adults. And a lot of things have happened in the, even in genetics, so even intra-uterine diagnosis. So that's how I'm also the Global Eye Genetic Consortium Secretary General, along with Dr. Takeshi Wata. People are working on. So I think moving towards from uh, continuing as a surgeon, but uh, in between all this. So the most common cancer that starts in the eye is the melanoma in the world over. But uh, you heard Dr. Uh, uh, Bhavna Chal talking about retinoblastoma, which is more common in India. And I, when I went to Vienna, to an ocular oncologist, I mean, that patient, they, can you believe the OPD? They have 50 melanomas coming in a day. And then follow-ups and new patients. And uh, I mean, they really, people don't know that melanoma. Fortunately, I think, because of pigmentation, Indians are spared. But I remember uh, operating uh, two of the patients, one with a melanoma. I did an internal resection. And uh, with that time, we tried stereotactic surgery with the uh, individual hospital, the gamma knife, but any of the patient, any of the patient is surviving because we could treat. And one more, I will call it a mistake, we went away, there was a masquerade syndrome, child was referred with injury, with the injury was a blunt injury, but patient had endophthalmitis, that was the picture. So when I did a vitrectomy, the child, I have a routine habit of sending it for uh, PCR, for uh, culture and sensitivity, and part of it for histopathology to be sure. It's like my, it's there all the time. Any tissue, whether it's trauma or end of thermometer, I do. And suddenly, this happened on Saturday, and when I was operating only, I found something like a creamy substance, and I thought, uh, it doesn't look like a tumor, and retinoblastoma never came in my mind. But anyway, I had a video recording, and I sent the specimen, luckily it reached, and so I don't know why, on a Monday morning, uh, Dr. Bishwas opened it and found and he called me, it's an emergency. You ch call the child back as the child will die. And I was really scared. And at that time, uh, Dr. Mahesh Shanmu was doing the PhD in uh, uh, retinoblastoma. So I sent the child, they did a chemotherapy. The child is alive. I keep celebrating with her birthday. And uh, I, uh, uh, she's in from, I referred from, BA. so he, in spite of all the experience you can miss. So I think it's important to uh, create awareness within the ophthalmologist, that's why I'm happy Bhavna selected a mid-year conference to inaugurate this. And I think every state, this is what I'm telling, teleophthalmic society, it's not for proper I think I'm beyond uh, all these uh, recognitions and I think I think we should b give back to society. I mean, any other place I should have retired by this age, but I don't look that, no? But I decided to do more service and uh, for the next 35 years. So the cancer is a malignancy that starts and grows in the eye, and uh, which I think uh, all of us sitting here know, just now Bauna mentioned this. And uh, so eye cancer is a rare disease, meaning treatment efforts across the world vary, and that access to care is not always readily available. I think that's why I accepted this as a social cause, and I think uh, we have to motivate people to uh, keep them aware, because if you detect early, probably you can save the vision, the eyeball, and the life. And people don't know. And I remember the exam questions when I was an undergraduate as well as a postgraduate in the 80s that a, a patient comes with a, a glass eye and uh, something has been in the second is in the liver. What will you think? I mean, uh, the melanoma. Because I think it was all theory that time. And now we see in the reality. And there are very few foundations in India dealing exclusively with eye tumor. There's one such foundation in Bangalore, which is a... Where the, that's a... Hmm? Uh, Iksha Foundation. So uh, that person had a friendship with the chairman of the RBL Bank in Bombay. So they collected four crores and gave. And they did a road show. One, um, I forgot her name now, she's a Rotarian. Uh, she, with her husband, does the uh, cycling and collects money from Bombay to Bangalore. And then uh, she collected like that. And so they have given money to this foundation. So similar thing I think we should do because people are doing. Mm -hmm. And then we can give to the people who cannot uh, afford to uh, yes. take the treatment or also for research. So thus there is a need to have an exclusive institute of eye cancer. I'm sure 
Bhavana should be able to create a separate uh, eye cancer institute within uh, RP center, which is possible, and that's the homework for you. So you can have a parallel to RP center. So thanks to Dr. L.P. Agrawal, who could create a parallel aims and made a RP center. I mean, I rem if you see the origin, I think the uh, RP center was equal to aims, and now aims has big, become bigger. But a similar thing you can do for, uh, I think, Delhi would be the best place to have the institute with a focus on patient care, rehabilitation, education, research, and innovation. And I, why can't you, you have worked in Washington, and you worked in the US, and you have seen all the clinics. Why can't we create something like a Mayo Clinic and in the institute, and which is possible? And I think uh, even our prime minister is ready for a private, uh, uh, private uh, partnerships, uh, public-private partnership, which you can collect money from the private also, and have the government, and have a separate uh, institute. So the main aim of establishing an eye cancer society in India is to develop and encourage national multicenter research on new diagnostic treatment, to provide much needed support services for patients and their family, and to save lives through our fellowship program by training doctors in underserved and unserved areas to treat eye cancer. The mission, mission of the eye cancer society would be to create a world-class resource for patients and their families diagnosed with eye cancer in the form of ocular tumors or melanoma and related ophthalmic conditions. The Eye Cancer Society of India will support research efforts that will advance treatment and methods and overall the rate at which eyes and lives are saved. With research, eye cancer can be probably even prevented and then treated. A fight against eye tumors, ocular melanoma and other eye cancer diseases. So I thank my team for preparing this. It's a very short presentation. So if you have a cat eye, don't ignore. And I think in India, I, uh, even a congenital cataract is neglected. But I'm sure now we are much better off, even in the villages. With it. I think through teleophthalmology, if you take a simple photographs like this and send it with the using of AI, I think AI should be able to diagnose whatever we are dealing with. So I think uh, the remedy has come out with the software, both for anterior-segment photograph and posterior-segment. I don't have any financial interest. but we can use the same, uh, just anti-segment photograph and a fundus photograph, even though it will cover only the uh, disc and uh, around. And that's enough for basic screening. And then later, I think uh, we can have uh, peripheral tumors. I think if the pa patient goes uh, to the advanced center, it can be done. So with this, I think, I hope we will create more interest in uh, uh, ophthalmic uh, oncology. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Excellent talk. So we also have uh, one talk from UK. Uh, Dr. Sachin Salvi could not come in person, but he sent a recorded presentation. And since this theme is about global perspectives, it would be uh, very uh, useful for us to listen to what he has to say, and especially because his, also his talk is on adult eye cancers, which you just mentioned. So we'll just play the recording. <laughs> In the meantime, if anybody has any questions, yeah, just yeah, just give us five minutes. In the meantime, if anybody has any questions, we are happy to take them. Epigenetics. <laughs> no, I think this is what I think. If you are happy, every cell in the body will be happy. That's the same question I'm answering more all over the world now. And there's a, spe there's a special theory of relativity. I don't know whether you heard that. If two twin brothers, one brother stays and works here, and one twin brother flies into the space, in, uh, so much, in 20, 15 light years, uh -huh. by the time he returns, the guy in uh, uh, 15 years later, the guy in uh, Earth will look uh, 65, and the guy who traveled and came will look 18 like me. <laughs> uh, Einstein has described this. So it's mutually, and you, you mutually, you are in the opposite pair. Yes. <laughs> And I, I 
also believe this law of attraction and law of uh, uh, visualization. You visualize what you want. So that's why I put it in even the presentation, whatever I put, many people will think it looks like a, uh, just a prepared for political. But no, one day it will happen. So now I have, I have told uh, spontaneously she should create an institute of uh, ocular oncology inside the AIMS. We'll go outside, no? Okay. Is it going? But he's having a manifestation. Why not you go to the... Because already they are coming. Four, five, yeah. Okay, okay. Take it. Can you run it? We'll just run it quickly. distinct pleasure to speak at the inaugural session of the Eye Cancer Society of India. Thank you, Dr. Chawla, for the invitation. My name is Sachin Salvi, and I lead the Sheffield Doctor Oncology Service we will just in the UK. Wrap it up in five minutes. The Eye Cancer Society of India is being established at a very session late I'd start my presentation by some hard facts. One in two people in UK born in 1960 are of these cancers can be attributed to known risk factors. These risk factors include age. We know the general population is surviving longer and the older you get, there is a higher chance of developing cancer. But importantly, there are significant environmental factors that predispose to cancers. Uh, smoking, tobacco, excessive alcohol, eating processed foods such as processed meat, uh, poor diet, overweight, obesity, uh, exposure to sun, excessive exposure to sun radiation, uh, pollution, viral infections such as HPV virus, other infections, and the ever so common sedentary lifestyle with limited physical activity is all thought to attribute to the increasing numbers of cancer in UK as well as the world. There is, of course, an element of bad luck uh, in UK itself. There is a 1 in 14 million chance of winning the national lottery jackpot, but the chance of developing uh, one of the rarest eye cancers, uh, choroidal melanoma, uh, is 5 in a million. Why is it important to know these risk factors? Well, 4 in 10 of these cancers could be prevented by simply a healthier lifestyle. This is important not just for our patients, but also for ourselves and our families. This significant increase in number of cancers is not simply a problem of the West. It is an enormous problem that is going to develop if it's not already developed in India. It's thought that one in nine people in India are at risk of developing cancers. People are living longer. It is thought that most Indians will live past 75 and just with the enormous population, I mean, if you compare UK population of 67 million, population of India is 1.4 billion. The number of new cancer cases diagnosed every year is huge. In UK, it was 375,000 a year, and in India, it is 1.15 million. So how are adult eye cancers treated in UK? Uh, in UK, as you know, we have a national health service with uh, smaller cities and towns having district general hospitals and larger cities having teaching hospitals. Um, all eyelid cancers are managed predominantly by ocular plastic surgeons in district general hospitals, teaching hospitals. Uh, 
More complex cancers such as orbital tumors are managed in teaching hospitals by orbital surgeons and rare eye cancers such as ocular surface and intraocular tumors are managed in suprarenal centers at London, Sheffield, Liverpool and Glasgow. These cancers include uveal melanoma, intraocular metastasis, intraocular lymphoma, ocular surface tumors such as ocular surface squamous neoplasias, ocular surface um, conjunctival melanomas, conjunctival lymphomas and other rare cancers. So why the need for suprarenal centers for these rare cancers? Well, it allows us to deliver the best care even for the rarest form of cancers. These services are nationally funded, so we are able to provide patients with the most expensive treatment free of cost. It allows us to give time and expertise to every patient. Every patient gets discussed um, at a multidisciplinary team to provide best possible treatment option. There is a group of uh, nurses, psychologists, teams which will support our patients, help in counseling, breaking bad news. It allows us to act quickly, reduce cancer waiting times, um, treat the patient holistically, liaise with other cancer specialties if patients have, for example, metastasis, multiple cancers, or uh, cancers which involve more than one region. It also allows us to maintain a robust database and allows us to follow the patients regularly, provide surveillance, it provides teaching as well as research opportunities, and being treated in a center of excellence means that the system is medically legally robust, you know, mistakes happen, but we are able to minimize them by ensuring we have the best care possible in a multidisciplinary settings. It also allows us to compare outcomes. Um, one important part of cancer care is to ensure that you all centers provide the best outcomes. We have regular meetings with all the centers where we discuss our outcomes and ensure that um, we learn new technologies, learn from each other, we formulate national guidelines, uh, and all this is possible simply by close liaison with the four supra-regional centers. Shafi Local Oncology Service was established in 1987 by the legendary Prof. Rennie. Um, he was soon after joined by Paul Rundle yeah. and I now lead the service having been at SOOS uh, for the... I'm going to... In UK, patients often see the opticians as the first point of contact and if a suspicious lesion is noted, they are referred to uh, the local ophthalmology team and if there is a definite suspicion of uveal melanoma, the patients are immediately referred to the National Cancer Centres where we assess them holistically uh, with various tools. We use the TNM classification to decide patients are then discussed at a multidisciplinary team meeting. Treatment modalities for uveal melanoma include ruthenium plug bracket therapy, proton beam therapy, stereotactic radiosurgery, photodynamic therapy or here's a slide describing in what situations we would decide what treatment. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Plaque bracket therapy, applying and really proton beam therapy. Uh, again, complex planning is done and the patient's treated at Clutter Bridge with stereotactic radius is helpful in patients with inucleation. Well, PDT is used for very small tumors. So in summary, over the last 10 minutes, we've noted that the incidence of cancer is reaching epidemic levels. Uh, there are risk factors that can be managed and may help reduce the incidence. Mm -hmm. Care of rare cancers and complex cancers is best in supra-regional centers. An MDT approach provides the best care for patients uh, while well, allows us to give a holistic care to patients and really it's important to take ownership by the oncologists uh, as ophthalmic oncologists for these rare group of cancer patients. Not about just treating the lesion but it's about saving the lives, saving their eyes, saving their vision. I believe
ओके